Wow. And you're just thinking, you're just thinking like, <laughs> sorry, on, like? I, this is such a good conversation. I had to start the recording here. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. But no, then, but it's nuts. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, Rodney uh, was just ex explaining that one of the music videos for his band, Violent Delight, it cost $40,000 to make it. And that song, now that song, I Wish I Was a Girl, that song was viral before being viral was a thing because there were kids on the playground at my school singing that song. <laughs> and like, they're all saying it's such a wicked song. I wish I was a girl. And the crowd that you played to at Reading Festival as well, like for, for you weren't even on the main stage. You were on the second stage and the whole tent is completely packed. And you're like the first band of the day. Like that. Yeah, we, we yeah, we opened the tent. Never we were happened. blown away. Never happens. Yeah. yeah, like, how did that come about? Like, do you think some of them were there waiting for, like, the band after you? Or do you think because that tent was closer to the main entrance, they just caught up, kind of huddled in there? Or do you think you just had such a big following that people were like, fuck yeah, let's go watch Violent Delight, first band? I don't, I don't know. I mean, uh, it was a bit of a funny one. I think, what was it? Yeah, it was Reading. It was... Um, there's a bit of a funny story to that gig actually, because the day before was the Kerrang Awards and our bass player got apps. Like we got, we got told you can go to the Kerrang Awards. Yeah. But you got the biggest gig of your career coming up tomorrow. So don't get too pissed guys. Don't get too pissed. And our bass player was like the, the last person you'd expect. He was that he was like the one who was going to make sure we were all cool. Like there was like, you know, Rod, don't let Rod go crazy because you know, it'll fuck up. Anyway, he ended up getting so drunk. He, he was just like collapsed in the foyer and we had to pull him out. And, and he didn't even really wake up um, until like, cause we actually drove from the Kerrang Wards to the hotel in Reading. Yeah, yeah. We had to carry him, put him in the bed and uh yeah we were we were like maybe an hour before we were meant to play we were trying to get him out of bed Slap. and he was like comatose and then once we kind of got got him in the in the bus he was like yeah cool i'm ready to go played the gig and he had a bucket by the side of the stage to be sick in i was furious with him i was like thinking i was going to kill him he did in fairness he did like manage to somehow get the energy to play a gig and then i think he just went straight back to the hotel and just slept Man, that, crazy. that day, that was my favorite festival. And I've been to many festivals and many shows in my 31 year life, nearly. That day was my favorite day ever. And I'm so bummed that I missed you guys for two reasons. Number one is uh, we had on the main stage that day, you had In Me, followed by I think Less Than Jake, Stained, Blink-182 and Linkin Park. Linkin Park, yep. And, and Bowling for Soup. Uh, the main that would never happen anymore at Reading Festival because that kind of music's not popular anymore. But the other reason that I was so surprised that you also had such a big crowd is, and this isn't to discredit your band, it was literally that when you're the first band of the day and it's like the Friday or, or the Saturday, a lot of people are arriving, they've got yeah. to park, they've got to park, they've got to make their tent. They're more concerned with getting their tent up, getting food and getting beer than they are watching the first band. So like I was watching In Me on the main stage and they only had like maybe a couple hundred people watching them, which was surprising for quite a big UK band. Um, and you you had obviously a hunting. And I honestly, I think it was, a lot of it was due to, you know, that single uh, was so big. I how, how did that go so viral back then before the internet. I know there was like Kerrang! and Scars and there was like MTV and there was compilation CDs, which is how I discovered you. Uh, and Kerrang! was giving out free samples every once in a while. Yeah. What do you think was riding on the so, success? I, I, think, I think the video, the video really helped to be fair. Um, and so we had this like weird thing with MTV2 um, because we, I think it was like something like four or five weeks in a row, they would do like a daily request show mm. or whatever. And I remember the, the host of that show clearly didn't like the song because after like the week of being at number one, he was like, what well, again? Like and it, this went on to three, four, three, four, I think it was maybe like five weeks, but I think it was like a different sort of time. Like I kind of feel like, 
if it had happened now, where we're a lot more savvy to this is what the public want, just give them what they want. Whereas before there was a bit more kind of editorial and it was like the hosts were really like, this is the kind of music we like and we want to play this, this music. But I think that was a, that was, that was a big thing. I think, um, I think as well, like we had toured our asses off that year and we were just, I don't know, I think in festivals, right? There are certain bands that are just fun festival bands. And I think it might have been that with us because we'd done download and we, we played to a really good crowd and we got a really decent write up. Um, there was another big festival. It was a one off. It was actually at what is the O2 now, but it was when it was the Millennium Dome. Snickers, um, Snickers uh, festival. Yeah, game was it Game On or something game, like Game On festival. For anyone who's watching and doesn't know what that is, that used to be a punk rock and skateboarding festival, and I think Kelly Osbourne headline. Yeah, yeah, and and you're right. Download is one and a half months before Reading, and Download is yeah, fantastic place to to play. Obviously, because it's strictly rock and metal and punk rock. So I guess. Do you know? Do you know the crazy thing was though that the one we played that was the first ever download yes which it was. yeah you know which i completely forgot until like i was i was like literally clearing out some stuff i found this program and you know i was i was showing my daughter and she's really not interested in it but um but then i realized it was like oh it's the first ever download i'm like jesus because it's like an institution now you know what i mean it's like the kind of like rock metal gig of the year you know it, it's so so to think of it as like well it's this well let's try it out let's see and actually that that gig that festival weekend had some amazing bands playing i think it was maiden played audio slave um i'm trying to think who else who else was there metallica were special guests that just turned up in the middle of the day um zwan which was billy corgan's band after smashing pumpkins there was so i mean there were so many uh, great bands uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do the shame for Disturbed, who I love. They were on, and I know lots of people hate Disturbed, but I think they're brilliant. Um, and everyone used to say David Draymond was a dickhead, but I met him and he was literally one of the nicest people in, in rock music. Well, funnily um, enough, um, four, four days ago, uh, Jarrett from Bowling for Soup, he posted a picture of him and the singer from Stained uh, in 2003, because they did the same sort of festival circuit as you did. And Bowling for Soup, their first big hit, Girl All the Bad Guys Want. Yeah. They were making fun of him. That was the whole music video was them making fun of Stained. And so he thought, oh crap, it's going to be really awkward. And he turned out to be the nicest guy. It's always who you least expect. And uh, did you have a booking agent or a management who was getting you on, on Download Festival? Or was it all? Uh, yeah, yeah, we did. I mean, like, that's, that's probably another reason. Like, we had, we had a really good team. Um, our, um, our promoter was a guy called Andy Copping, who is, um, like the premier rock promoter still now. Uh, there was a, our agent was Emma Banks. She was head of Helter Skelter. So we, we had some pretty like big dogs in our, in our court, in our corner. Our manager, Tony Medcalf was, I mean, she was independent, but she looked after, I don't even remember Dirty Harry. Well, she rebranded herself as Harry. And she had previously worked with uh, Bruce Dickinson from Iron Maiden. So we had like, we had some good, and our, and our, you know, we were on Warner Brothers. So we had like major label clout and we had our publishing company was a, like they're an indie publisher called uh, J Albert and Sons, but they, their claim to fame and their big power in the industry is they discovered ACDC. So like, Again, you've kind of, do you know, a lot of the music industry is like favors for favors and bits and pieces like that. So I'm sure, you know, like, like I said, going back to like our agent, Emma, Emma Banks, uh, her clients, she had Madonna, she had the Red Hot Chili Peppers, she had Marilyn Manson. So if you want Marilyn Manson to play download, you'll have Violent Delight as well. Do you know what I mean? It was like, it's, it's that sort of thing. That's, that's where it, that's where it all goes. So, you know, I mean, there, there are, there are, um, there are pros and cons to that as well um, in that, you know, if things start not going well for you, they can lose interest pretty quickly. Whereas maybe a, a smaller agent would really fight for your band or whatever. But, you know, I mean, that's probably, that probably helped. It, it's kind of so strange now because like being, being like a musician who then went independent, like was kind of doing the independent route afterwards and getting back into music, you're kind of just like, oh man, it was so easy when you've just got like, 
this amazing infrastructure that you can kind of rely on and, and you don't even think about you know it wasn't you, you're really spoiled because it wasn't like how are we going to get on reading it was which stage are we going to play on and what day so it's kind of you know it's like proper like you know first world problems uh, which uh, you know a lot of people including me would kill for <laughs> now i mean that's just but that's just how the industry is it's true. Actually, I went to school and played in a band briefly with the singer of the band. Uh, they're called Holy Good. And they signed with Warner Brothers last year. And their first tour was with Busted. So they're literally opening up the O2 arena. And yeah. they just signed a deal. Uh, and it makes total sense. It, it's the same reason that Rise Records in America, all of their artists play the same festivals. They play the same thing. Yeah, And how did you get that deal in the first place was it through touring or was it through demos or what was the oh, well, this so this is this is kind of a bit of a crazy thing because literally i think i i remember counting it out it was like i think the 15th or 16th gig i ever played was the london astoria like which is mental um but it was this really weird kind of uh, i don't know like i guess chance meetings that happen and um so me and the guitarist, we went to school together and the guitarist's father, he was a music teacher. And while it's probably quite common now, it certainly wasn't sort of 20 plus years ago for music teachers to really be into rock music. And what uh, Tom, the guitarist's father, Renee would do is he would teach, you know, guitar or drums or bass at all these schools. And then what he'd do is put on like a, a showcase concert for all of his um all of his students to play in and uh, that's how you know i you know being friends with tom um so we started like playing covers and stuff and it was like oh cool you know we can we can be introduced to musicians and we can we can start start playing like, like this anyway fast forward a few years after doing that a few times and starting to write our own songs there was a student of of renee's um, who little did we know his father was the head of this publishing company that we would eventually signed to and uh, we were meant to play like a gig in a school hall right um and our drummer at the time was ill and couldn't make the gig like so at the last minute um tom's dad Rene, who's a good drummer said well if no one if you can't find anyone i'll jump in you know it might be a, it might look a bit funny but i'll jump in and play the gig with you um and uh, you know this was like two or three days before the, for the gig and he was teaching the, the 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 guy's son and he mentioned oh um i'm going to be playing a gig actually you know and wow. this little kid wanted to see his drum teacher play the drums so he came to the gig and his father came to the gig too and he saw us and was like you know i mean we would have been maybe 14 15 but it was very strange for 14, 15 year, old, 15 year olds to play like six to eight original songs. Well, yeah. And I think that's what caught his eye. And I Wish It Was A Girl was one of, one of the songs. Um, and it's a, it's a really funny one because we, we wrote it like for a bit of a laugh. It, it, I mean, I wrote all the lyrics in about 15 minutes, almost just as I was thinking about them. And then we recorded it and, and whatever. So play this gig. And then all of a sudden we're getting this, um, this guy calling up going, um, I'm interested in doing a deal with you guys. I, I want to do your publishing. Um, I, want, I want to um, have you guys come to our recording studio and record a demo over the summer. And it was like, what? This is, this is mental. So we ended up doing that. Off the back of that, he, little did we know, he started, once, once we had this version, he started touting it to record labels and managers and whatever ended up bringing in um, this, this lady called Tony Medcalf who ended up being our manager and um, probably I'd guess un uh, unluckily for the publishing company, she then, I think what the publishing company wanted to do or what the guy, James, um, his, his name's James Cassidy. He actually, um, I think he's like one of the guys who discovered, do you know the band Mason Hill who are doing really well now? So he's like, he, his management company now is kind of looking after them and they're, they're doing amazing. But I, th I think from what I know, looking back on it, he, I think, wanted to sign us on what we would call a production deal where they would basically be the label and they would do everything. 
but I don't think he could quite get the sign off from Australia because because uh, they're an Australian company and I think they were a bit umming and ahhing. Anyway, so our our manager Tony then started probably doing a bit of a dirty on James and started sending this out to major labels. And we had Sony, we had Universal, we had uh, Warner's all pretty much coming in. Actually, the funniest one we had was a label called Relentless Records. They were a UK garage label who had discovered the So Solid crew and like Oxide and Neutrino. And they, and they had made a huge amount of money. They had a distribution deal. I can't remember who it was with, but they were just like, we want to diversify. So like we had this UK garage label trying to like maybe sign us. And eventually when Alberts came back in with actually, uh, you know, Australia wants to do a deal. I mean, I think just money wise, they just couldn't compete with what the majors were, um, were offering. And we ended up, we ended up going with, uh, going with Warner brothers. Um, and yeah, then, then, you know, I guess the rest is kind of history. They put us in, um, put us in touch with uh, Steve Jones, who was a guitarist in the Sex Pistols to produce a few tracks. Um, we did some, well, we did some writing with him as well because we, we didn't even have a full album. Like we, we probably had like four songs. Uh, it's crazy, like band, like it is literally like another world because this is from the day where, you know, you'd sign someone with potential and you'd put something, to, put something together. But, um, you know, now I think majors, they want like the finished article, you know, unless, unless it's something really special. And even then it, it's probably not the majors that are going in, going in to get that. But yeah, we ended up working with Steve and, and what was crazy is we spent, we spent ages trying to re-record I Wish It Was A Girl and it ended up being the demo that was, was released. Um, Cause that was kind of the big, big, well, everyone knew that would be the big single. Yeah, they can, and it's amazing. Uh, you can kind of tell like the recording back then process was very, very different from, from what it is now because a lot of fans these days, they use a lot of programmed drums and stuff like that. And uh, that was amazing. Do you think that if that song, cause it's kind of like apples and oranges that these days punk rock and pop punk is not as popular as it was back then. But if that song was released today, a song about wishing you were a girl, you know, with all these transgender controversial issues we've got going on and teaching your clip, like, do you think it would be a hit or do you think it would be a joke or do you think it would be like, you are fucking canceled? <laughs> I uh, see. So this is actually a really interesting one because if you, I don't know if you've ever gone into the YouTube comments of the, of the official video and there's, there's some really interesting, interesting debate on there. What I will say, which, okay, so I, I have a, um, a general kind of philosophy on music and lyrics and that, and that is that as an artist, you write the stuff and it's for the, um, your audience to kind of really get the meaning, um, you know, and, um, you, you know, I mean, songs are really powerful. And I'm sure, like, I can speak for myself, and I'd probably speak for you, that there are probably songs that have helped you through hard times. There are songs that you associate with uh, having great times and just listening to it just picks you up. Um, so I'm very much like, you put something out there, and if somebody can get something positive from it, um, I, like, that, that's, I think, what it's there for. Um, I, like, honest to God, I've probably had 20 or 30 people in the last maybe just two years, send me messages. You know, like, I don't know if you ever go onto like Facebook every so often, there's like, you know, like the restricted messages, like from people you aren't friends with, whatever. And every so often I'll just check that. And, and I've had, I've had like maybe 20 or 30 messages from people that said like, I was going through a really difficult time in my life. And this made me realize what my true identity was. And I've now transitioned. And wow. I'm just like, that's, do you know what? Like, I, I don't want to get into like, you know, for me, if you were suffering and something I did made it better for you, then all power to you. Do you, do you know what I, you know what I mean? Um, but at the same time, you go into the comments and there are some people that, you know, they they think that it was written from the perspective of someone with gender dysphoria. There are some people that think I'm some sort of like a hideous sexist bigot. Um, you know, there are, there are people who talk about, there are literally, you can go through the comments, there are people that talk about, this was a song that made me realize who I was and I transitioned. So it, it's, it kind of goes into what, like my philosophy on, on music, which is, 
it's there for the audience to get something from it. And if you, whatever you get from it, um, all power to you, you know? Or it's like, but I do think, I do think if it came out today, it would be canceled in about three minutes. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think so. Like if Logan Paul or Jake Paul or someone like that did it, it would be like, what the hell? But you guys were like, you're like a bunch of 14, 15, 16 year olds. It's obviously a joke. It's like, it's ideas. And like Ricky Gervais said recently that when he writes jokes, they're not serious, they're jokes, they're ideas, they're, it's satire. And uh, it's obvious that, you know, whether or not you were serious when you wrote it, it doesn't matter. It's like, you either choose to get offended by it or not. But it was, yeah. what it was, was it was a party song. And 2000 to 2004, I, the demographic, my audience, you know, we're all probably, most of us are 20 to 35. This was a time when, like it was all about just partying and not being serious when it came to the music. I, you look at bands like Offspring with Pretty Fly for a white guy, that probably wouldn't go down very okay. well these days. And uh, 2001 to the, yeah, 2005, it was just all about like having fun. And it's from 2005 onwards, and this is probably where like, if you wrote the, like, the second album and like kept going and going and going and going, that it might've been different is that music didn't get just more serious it's the fact that pop punk and punk rock became something different it became almost like this emo influenced pop yeah. punk and punk rock and then it became uh like easy core and it, it kind of kept spiraling into something different but after uh violent delight finished you formed a band who i thought would have been perfect uh you formed Susie hope didn't you and yeah it's, it's interesting what i think of all these bands who've been together three or four years and they're still playing 200 capacity venues, still recording demos, still like playing festivals and like trying to get noticed and stuff like that. Like maybe playing Slam Dunk Festival, recording YouTube videos. In fact, YouTube videos is a great way to get discovered these days, kind of like how MySpace was back in the day. The sheer fact that your band got signed on like such a strange chance event it's absolutely mind boggling. It's mind blowing. Like that is like, it's like it was meant to happen. Well, what, um, first of all, tell us what happened that sort of led to the slow decline of VD. And then what happened with, with Susie Hope? Because in the era of MySpace and the fact that you're all like good looking guys and you were kind of making pop punk punk rock because it was also sort of indie-ish as well. Like it, I would have thought it'd be yeah. perfect for that time. I'm just going to so, close my window because there's a storm outside, literally. No worries. Yeah, the, the weather here in the Czech Republic has COVID. It can't decide. <laughs> yeah, all right, carry on. So, so, so yeah, so I, I tell you, it, it's really interesting that you brought that up because I think you probably described the reason it was really difficult to kind of make the next move. Because we didn't do the typical this is what you do to get signed like you're kind of sitting there going how do you get a record deal like how does this happen like what what, what is it that we need to do whereas you know maybe if we'd done the conventional route of like you get on the you know you you just get on the touring circuit you build your fan base you do that you do, you know you know it, it's very much we got signed to a major and it was just like right we make the calls you get in kerrang magazine you're like you, but that's the thing you're just in kerrang magazine there's no there's no discussion of how you get in it's how many words they're going to write about you because again it was like you know like i said the, the thing about um like our agent you want Mar you want marilyn manson you've got to book van der Light. it would be like you know because we were on warners you know they had lincoln park they had the deftones they had green day so you if if you know and this is how it works you know if you want lincoln park on the front cover you have a half page on Van der Light. Do you know? And that's that's how it, that's how the industry works. It's it's it still is. It still is. That's why you know people that are really good with PR and and to and to, to be perfectly honest, like we, um, you know, our press at at, um, at Warner's was done by um, a lady called Emma Van Dutz, who runs now uh, Public City PR, which is an independent, 
and they are like i mean she was an amazing press officer and like she's gone on to become like a powerhouse in the industry so i, I don't think it's just it wasn't just the clout it was also you're dealing you have the best of the best of emerging talent in every aspect of the music industry looking after you and, and, and doing those things so i'm sure that really helped but one of the other things as well was when we were doing Susie Hope, um, actually, sorry, I'll go back a bit. How did all Vine the Light kind of fall apart? Yeah. Um, yeah. So there came a point where things were, I think, I think basically I Wish It Was A Girl was way more successful than they thought it was going to be. Right. And the really sad thing about being on a major label is if you exceed expectations, all other expectations rise. So when we got signed, um, you know, they were talking about us probably putting out a record that might sell 20 to 30,000 units, right? And in those days, like now, that would be a huge amount of records. But in those days, that wasn't, that wasn't particularly big. You know, that wasn't particularly big. That was like building because bands were signed with the express purpose that they're going to put our debut second record will build and the third record is the record you know i think about bands like um you know radiohead are a really good example of that you know pablo honey the bends okay computer do, do, do you know whereas i think well like 182 had cheshire absolutely. cat and then dude ranch sort of pretty pretty damn popular and then enter of the state was like whoa Bang. Yeah, and the same. The same. Green Day. You got like ten thirty nine. Kaplunk. Dookie. Like that's, that's how it. That's how it worked. Um, so they never expected. They were hoping one of our singles might reach the top forty. Anyway, so they they put out "Wish It Was a Girl" and it hit number twenty five. And originally, originally, the album was meant to come a week. I think a week or two weeks after "I Wish It Was a Girl." But when "I Wish It Was a Girl" went to number twenty five they were like let's delay the album because we might be able to get top 10 with the next single wow right and so that's and and well what happened though was when i wish it was a girl had the success it did there was a basically a lot of the press that had been supporting on us kind of started to turn a little bit um and there were lots of kind of allegations that we were a manufactured band um and Fuck. the label um, were getting quite kind of, oh, we're not sure about this. Fuck. And we had a big meeting before we did the video for All You Ever Do, or before when we were coming up with the campaign and whatever. And our manager was adamant. Okay, we've been on, you know, MTV2. We've been on Kerrang. We've got Scuzz. There's, there was P-Rock as well you know, rest in peace. I think actually probably most of them are gone now, but you, you know what I mean? And she was like, we need to do uh, the box. We need to do MTV. We need to be on smash hits. If you want to go top 10, we actually need to push this in this direction. We want to do a really like bright, fun um, video. And we we were kind of pushing a treatment like, I don't know if you remember, there's a song All American Rejects had called Give You Hell. Yeah. I yeah. don't know if you, re have you seen the music video? Yeah, yeah. That was the sort of look we were going through. Really bright colors and daytime and whatever. And then the label, they were like, oh no, but there are all these accusations that you're manufactured. So we want to go gritty. We, we don't want to be in these publications. We don't want to do this because we want to show that you're a real band. And our manager was just like, how though will you get the growth you know if you don't open up the the thing so we ended up getting a great treatment for video then there was like there was like this back and forth oh no the video looks too poppy we'll change it from you know we'll change it from a daytime video to a nighttime video and it just became a bit of a like and what we wanted to do was um it was meant to be like a real parody video yeah. So I don't know if you remember the video, but we had like the tattoo girls. Yeah. Uh, like we had a, we had a spoof of tattoo, but one of the, one of the other ones that we wanted to do the original version of the video, there was a guy. So 
at the start of the video, there's a fat guy writing in a diary, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So this is an idea of how much this video has changed. It was meant to be a spoof of Stan by Eminem. Yeah, yeah. So the original person was someone who looked like Eminem. So it was like, we're, you, you know, and it was following in the vein of things like girl or the bad guys want yeah. all the small things. That, that's the kind of aesthetic that we yeah, want to go for, great, yeah. right? But that big fat guy, that was, they were like, well, we don't want it to be so obvious it's Eminem. So we'll recast it as a giant fat guy. And then all of a sudden, that whole joke is gone because it's not obvious who that is. That's annoying because you know what? This is Warner Brothers we're talking about. Yeah. How many? How much do they want to ruin? They ruined Batman and the Justice League. Now, <laughs> they're, now they're ruining Violent Delight. It's just so true. And I understand. All right. On one end of it, I sort of understand because at the time you had busted McFly, and then you had a bunch of other bands who were playing their own instruments. The thing is, right? There's no way in hell ever that. Busted or McFly would be able to get away with writing a song like I exactly. was a girl. There, there was no doubt in my mind that you were a manufactured band. They only thought that because, yeah, you were young. But I remember watching CBBC with my younger brother. I have a younger brother who's nine years younger than me. And the background music that they were using on CBBC whilst the presenters talked to the TV was The Offspring. The Offspring were on mainstream radio, capital yeah. radio. They were on, like, there is no doubt that The Offspring and Blink-182 and Green Day, like, these were all real bands, and they were all mainstream. American Idiot was the biggest punk rock album. Oh, yeah. And all of these kids, like, these normal preppy kids with their Abercrombie and Fitch hoodies were listening to Green Day, and they were listening to Violent Delight and stuff at the same time. And of all things to worry about, right, they could have been worried about anything to do with your band you being a manufactured band was the least of their concern okay there, there was even if you were like and the press are giving you shit for that there's nothing to be concerned about that because there wouldn't even be any shame in that even if you were well Go exactly but it was it but anyway all that happened right was we ended up with a video that I just don't think it was right for the single. We then submitted it, and I think only Scuzz and P Rock took it. So we ended up not getting Kerrang support. We didn't get support from MTV2. So we ended up with essentially less weapons than we had to get to 25 with a single they wanted to go top 10. And you're like, oh shit, do you know? And then also, you know, we were talking about how music videos like, start to go out of control with costs because there were so many changes and recasting and this and that you end up going over budget by thousands and thousands of pounds tens of thousands of pounds so we end up with this video that doesn't really serve the song like in the best way possible it doesn't get on the the channels but then what was really weird was when that single came out we were like it's like they weren't communicating because all the press we were getting, we were in like Sugar, Bliss, J17. So like the press department were going with what our manager wanted, which was mass appeal. Like we were on, we were in there and like, you know, they, they I mean, it sounds so stupid, but you know, they would do like these bad boys issues where, you know, you would have like, well, no, but the, but the bad boys would be like good Charlotte. And, you know, people with tattoos and do, do, do you know what I mean? So it was all that stuff. And the neck braces. And the, absolutely. Know. Absolutely. So, so we ended up with this thing anyway. Like, the crazy thing is, after all of that, all you ever do ended up getting to number 38, which the irony is, had I Wish I Was a Girl gone to regular expectations, mm -hmm. uh, all you ever do hitting number 38 would have been, like, great success. And, you know, to have a top 40 single as a rock band in those days was mad like but then but then what happened is they were like oh we're gonna put the the record back again because that isn't a big enough platform so actually that was the crazy thing as well about um doing the reading festival the album hadn't even come out ah. right yeah. so so that was that was the other thing so we played the reading festival and then our album didn't come out for like six weeks i think afterwards so all of those kids who had seen us at Reading and blah, 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 six weeks is a long time. You know, I really, like, there was so much that sort of went, like, went against us. And when the album came out, 
it, like it came out with a single transmission, which I think got to like number 45 or something. Yeah, yeah. And it's just like, they just, they pretty much just wrote us off. So that kind of, that kind of all fell by the wayside. And at that time, because it wasn't, it wasn't going right. Um, like our guitarist, Tom, he was, he was, he was kind of like thinking whether he really wanted to be a musician. Um, mm. He, he right. was like, I kind of want to go back to school, which was, I don't know. It didn't, it didn't make sense to me, but I, I don't know. I've always dreamt of doing music and whatever, and maybe he didn't. Um, and then, yeah, we kind of, we kind of changed up the guitarist. We brought in a new guy, um, brought a new guy, Drew, who's actually um, the guitarist in my band now. Yeah. Um, but um, then what happened is kind of, there was a bit of like a, not a falling out, but like I started writing with another person, Adam, who was the guy who was in Susie Hope. Yeah. And Adam actually joined Vant the Light for a brief while. And actually the Susie Hope EP or whatever, we probably had about 12 songs um, that were written. They were written as Vant the Light songs. Yeah. And then we also had sort of like another five or six that we had done. But our bass player, Ben, he didn't like the direction. He wanted to go heavier and we wanted to go more poppy. And I think in hindsight, if we were a bit more mature, we would have all sat down and we would have just gone, look, just just go out there. Like our, our, um, our manager had all basically organized a big tour for us. We were meant to go, and this is crazy because they weren't big, at the, they weren't super big at the time, but it was like, it was on paper like a, a 12 week tour of the UK with Biffy Clyro, um, like doing a co headline. And her thing was print off 10,000 copies of the album and go out there and just sell 10,000 copies. But the problem is, you're doing this as an independent artist now because you're not on the label and it's you're not going to have a tour bus, you're not going to have crew, you're going to lift your own gear. And we were just so spoiled, we were just like. Oh, I don't know about that. I don't know if we want to do. Do, do you know what I mean? It was just really stupid. Really stupid. And you, also, now you would be like, "Yeah, hell yeah, let's go." And yeah, do exactly. It. I'd be like, "Yeah, fuck, this is amazing. This is, you know." And it probably, you know, just you know, bad decisions and being naive. And I think that does come from, you know, that is definitely the negative side of just having this like chance events that get you signed at random because you, you don't actually realize, understand the process. You didn't realize that like other bands, like, uh, you know, the Ataris who I interviewed two members of, they were taking their equipment on trains from Venice to Vienna and all this yeah. crazy, crazy stuff. Uh, Biffy Clyro, I remember they also played Download Festival and same year as you, and they also played Reading Festival. And by 2007, they were popping off uh oh man they they actually interestingly and it's probably again because of the record label i saw them in 2008 supporting lincoln park at the o2 arena i have i have so many questions i don't even know <laughs> where to begin but i think yeah did you did the the record that they were expecting to do 30 to 40 thousand units did it surpass their expectations in the end? Because you did have a huge following, A, and B, that song was very viral. And even though it had been six weeks, that's enough time for people to be like, this band's cool. <laughs> well, so this is the crazy thing. Like, yeah, we did. We did. Well, I think, I think we were around 30 something, right? Yo. But the crazy thing is the expectations had shifted. So when we were like, <laughs> So, so basically, when they decided to delay the record and they wanted a top 10, if you go in in the top 10, they're probably looking at 100,000. So do you, know, do you know what I mean? It's like it all kind of shifted then and it was just like, fuck, they, they're just constantly moving the goalposts. So we ended up selling probably what should have kept us in our deal. Mm. But because now, now I understand why, because I'm older, because they then spent a fuck ton of money on a music video that was wrong mm -hmm. but then they're like well if we spend more money you need to make us more money do you know uh, what i mean so there's yeah. there's the, there's this sort of balance but then like i said like we then did suzy hope and um what was really difficult was it was like the myspace thing was was happening um and as somebody who had benefited from the old way of doing things i was just like and getting advice from people from the industry all the advice I was getting from very, very respectable people was do not put a thing on there. 
Like just put samples of tracks, don't put whole things. And we just got caught in this kind of, the industry was changing. I mean, like we, like, I mean, I'm not like, not super close with them, but at the time, um, and I've got loads of mutual friends and we were always on the circuit with, with, uh, with that. Um, it's the band Gallows and the band Enter Shikari. Yeah. So they were in our local scene and, and uh, you know, I used to talk, I used to talk usually to, um, to, to Rory, the guitarist, and he would ask things like, you know, what do you think about, like, they would ask things like, what do you think about, about this? What do you think about that? And I would just say to them, why are you putting so much of your material up there? Because I was thinking the old school, I was thinking, you've got to keep it so that it doesn't get out there so that a record label will sign you. They'll give you a big advance and then you'll be able to do it. Whereas the Shikari guys, they, they clocked it, you know, they, they rode the wave and they, and because they were forward thinking, um, you know, and thinking, look, this is a new way of getting our music to people. This is a new way of, of interacting with, with fans. You know, they, they are definitely one of the bands them. Um, and I think the Arctic Monkeys were probably a, a, another, another big one who, um, who, 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 who really smashed it with, you know, I guess that was the early advent of social media. Um, but it was this kind of old industry thinking that I think was a real, a real sort of, hindrance to us uh, because we were you know we were like okay let's look for a deal and to be fair we got fairly close to getting a deal um uh, we we um we we had like american management um oh. and we we went out to la um and we had we had like a deal in principle to um to do um a record with uh, ryan key from yellow card Amazing. So it was all it was all looking quite good, but then what happened was our manager basically called me, and I'd known him from the VD days, and he said, "Look, listen, just be really straight with you. Um, getting visas and everyone for everyone, it's just it's not going to happen. Like it's just too expensive. Uh, but I've got a deal on the table. It's not it, like it was for a reasonable amount of money. Like I think it was about sixty thousand dollars." not enough for five people but if you want to come out it's enough for one and i think that the thing that was weird about susie hope is like all those guys i was in the band with they're like still today my best friends do you know and it was basically rod do you want to fuck over everyone and just go or and and do this or you know or there's nothing and at that point I think I was kind of quite jaded by, you know, years of trying and just like the industry changing and this. And I was just like, I don't think I want that. And that's when I kind of realized like, I don't like, how am I going to make it in the music industry if I'm not willing to do anything it takes to be successful? And also how can you ask, like, for example, our drummer was like, well, I'll just defer university another year. And it's like, so you've got somebody who's going to def potentially defer university for a project that you are saying yourself, you maybe don't pop properly believe in. When those are your friends, you can't really be doing that. Do you know what I mean? Like that's really selfish. And that's, so when I said no to the deal, I think that's when we, we all just decided, well, I think that this is, this is it for Susie Hope. But what was really cool is we decided to split up and we, you know, um, and then um, I think I think it might have been Chris or Rao from Enter Shikari called us and was like, "Oh, guys, like we're coming back." It was uh, it was after Take the Skies came out. It's like we're going to do a show at the Alban Arena, which is like the big venue in St Albans. It was like we just want we we wanted you guys to open for us, like, yeah. but like you guys are split up, and we were like, "We'll come back. We'll do one show." So yeah. literally, like, it was cool because our last gig was kind of like on home turf with like the, you know, the biggest band ever to come out of St. Albans, packed house. And we did like a really fun last show. And also as well, like people knew who we were because we were in that scene. So there was kind of like, it was kind of weird because there was like a really nice sort of closure to, to kind of Susie Hope finishing. But I think it's a bit of a shame because like it was, I think there were some good songs there. Um, I think it could have done something, but I think we just, like I said, it was like, the experience I had in, in VD really didn't actually set me up to be self-sufficient. You, you, you know what I mean? It didn't, it didn't set you up to really know how the industry worked or to give you the skills that you would need to do it again. It's kind of like, Oh, it's, it's all here for you. 
well, it's like it's like kidding. saying to it's like saying to someone who won the lottery, "How did you make all your money?" Yeah. They go, uh, "I bought a ticket and it all just came." Like so, when they lose all their money, they go, "Right, well, how can I earn this money again?" So, oh no, I know how to spend it, you know. And that's kind of, I guess, that's kind of what it was like. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess so. And um, you're right. Uh, and Shikari, Gallows, and ultimately now Frank Turner and the Rattlesnake. Not Frank Turner, sorry, Frank, Frank Carter. Frank Carter and the Rattlesnakes, and uh, also Yumi at Six as well, who I did a video on yeah. recently. I went to college with Yumi at Six, and. The thing is, like they did anything it would take, and one thing every single one of those bands, one thing they did, which not many bands I see doing these days, is they gave the demo for free. Oh, MySpace! If you remember back then, the uh, Enshikari songs on there were just demos, but they yeah. were good. They were good demos. Gallows demos, like um, what's their song "Abandoned Ship" uh, by Gallows? That was a huge demo and the other one they had uh, in the belly of a shark really yeah. really really good demos now uh, yumi at six they had the rumor so what these bands did they made really really good demos and they put them out there for free because the same way that i can only be successful on youtube if i get ten thousand to a hundred thousand subscribers they understood that we can only be successful and get the good gigs and get the good deals if we get a shitload of gigs, if we get a shitload of followers, if we get a shitload of MySpace friends and people use our MySpace songs as their profile songs. They they, they had a good understanding of, of how it worked. But like you said, the if you if you were if you were kids, like when you were playing a uh, Reading Festival, you were like what not 20 years old? Like I was 17. Seven shit, you were 17. Like I didn't know shit when I was 17. Absolutely. Like, yeah, no one no one knows shit when they're 17. I played in a band when I was 15, 16, and we had this beggars can't be choosers attitude. We were like, you know, even if we have to go to Oxford and get paid 50 quid, like we'll go and like, and like do that. But you don't know any of this when, when you're a kid, you know, you were just being told what to do. You didn't know, oh, I should do this on MySpace. Oh, I, oh, YouTube started, YouTube started in 2005. Yeah. On there. Like it was, one of those things, um, and I don't, I really don't blame you. I think if anyone else had been in the same position as you, it would have been the same thing. And the other thing, which is ironic, is that the record label, you released the song, I Wish I Was a Girl, which was quite a big hit. I mean, to go to number 25 and for it to be like a jokey punk rock song, you're like, you know, that wasn't really happening too much. But the thing is, like, they we're expecting you to follow up with something which was got to be, which was going to be like more mainstreamy, obviously, because you're only going to go to number yeah. 10 more mainstreamy. But I think that's probably why Kerrang didn't take it because they were probably like at the time it's maybe it's not our thing. I have no idea why they wouldn't because it's violent delight. Like I would have thought it would be like a no brainer for them, but uh, I still, used to watch Kerrang! and Scars a few years ago, back in 2016, because when I'd go to the gym, if there was no one there, I'd put it on. And yeah. the videos they play on there, they're still playing Gives You Hell. They're still playing, yeah. they're still playing Moves a lot, Move Along. They don't play new music these days. They might have like one hour a day, which is called like the, yeah. the new music hour or whatever, or local band hour. But most of the time, they're still playing System of a Down and The Offspring on their god knows why i mean i love those bands but you'd think they would do new music i i i honestly i have no idea why they wouldn't it's it's it do you know what it is it's it's just for viewers like it's harder to break new acts do you know what i mean you like in in an attention-based economy yeah. and, and 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 you maybe you maybe say well maybe that is what the medium of you know cable tv music is for now do you know what I mean? Just those greatest hits, you know, because that's really what social media is for, you know, discovering, discovering new bands. And, yeah. you know, it's, it's interesting how, how the industry has kind of changed and what it's becoming. And, um, you know, I mean, like Instagram is a really great place to find new music. Like, yeah, I mean, it's probably where I found all the new bands that I listen to. Until you know, I actually yeah. actively, I actively go out of my way to find new bands now, which is different because you do kind of get stuck in your little like, your little like 
2005 echo chamber of, uh, of all the songs. It's like, you know, after, after My Chemical Romance released Welcome to the Black Parade, I pretty much stopped listening to music. There's no point, you know? <laughs> yeah, so I don't know, like that, that's like the marker for me. It's like when, when I hear like, I don't know, Sex on Fire on the radio, I'm like, oh, that's quite a new song, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, 12, 12 years, no, 13 years ago, but yeah. Yeah, well, I know, it's fucking crazy. Um, I worked in a bar when I was at university, and that song got played so much that I used to actually get in a bad mood when I heard it. <laughs> but uh, my, my wife, she is from the Czech Republic, and uh, the music scene's not fantastic here. Prague is okay. Um, and there's like one or two pretty good festivals like Bring Me the Horizon or Amity Affliction might play them. But yeah, she, all the bands she likes are strictly through YouTube and like she'll put a song on that maybe she knows that she knew from when she was a kid, like Simple Plan or whoever. And then it will yeah. be suggested this, um, same thing happened to your band. Interestingly, that happened to Yellow Card. They also, they could not live up to the expectations way yeah. away and ocean avenue and only one was so big that when paper walls came out they couldn't live up to it the ataris again couldn't yeah. live up to it. i think that's probably why in the last 15 years i've noticed that there are so many bands starting their own labels and their own distribution yes. companies because they're like fuck this like, but it's also it's also about the money it's also about the money like you can you can get to a point, right? I think, I always think Jimmy Eat World are a really good example of a band that they blew up. And I th and one of the interesting things I think about Jimmy Eat World is when they blew up, they were a little bit older. You know, yeah. they, they do actually go back a fair few years. And one of the quite interesting things is, I think, it, I could be wrong, but I think they were on, on their second or possibly even third major label deal when Bleed the American came out, yeah. right? So they really understood how the industry worked. So one of the things that they had going for them with Bleed American is they actually did their deal with DreamWorks. It was actually um, what's known as a licensing deal. So they, um, they were produced, they did Clarity, which is an amazing album, which I think came out on Capitol Records and just didn't do very well. Um, there's, there's a, one of the songs, um, was actually, I think like on the soundtrack or the leads, uh, lead single from the movie, uh, Never Been Kissed with Drew Barrymore, which was like, you know, a rom-com. Um, so for then that video not to blow up the band, that was kind of like, this is a big failure or whatever. And, uh, they had been working with a producer called Mark Trombino. Uh, now Mark Trombino is, is is a legendary producer he produced uh, dude ranch for blink 182 yeah um and i, I mean like I, like i'm just having a bit of a mental blank but he's produced like that sort of music music i love he has produced some of the best records of of that style and from what i know uh, he was such a fan of of working with them he basically said right you don't have a deal at the moment that you're on let's just just come with an agreement and I'll basically do the record for free and you'll can sort me out later. So they actually recorded Bleed American without a label. Oh. So they've got this fucking record, which is going to be the, you know, a, you know, a legendary like emo rock record. It's probably the record. Yeah. And they just went around to all these labels and were like, look, we've got this record. It's finished. Do you want it? And they ended up doing a deal with DreamWorks and, it was a huge, huge success. Now, the, the crazy thing, when you do a licensing deal, you get far better return than you would for a regular um, deal because the, the label isn't putting up as much capital up front. So from what I understand, Jimmy Eat World basically took that windfall they got and they did things like build their own recording studio and set up the infrastructure so they could continue to make records. And I think that's basically what they do. They, they record the records and they license them. They record the records and they license them. When you do that, you can make, you know, factors more return on the record than you would if it's on a regular, a regular deal. Yeah. So, you know, this whole self-releasing, you probably, and, and this is crazy, like you probably need to sell only one for every five 
self-releasing to make the same record you would on a major label. So if Jimmy were like, so let's say Jimmy World would usually sell 500,000 records, then you'd sell 100,000 records doing it themselves. And for Jimmy Eat World, I'm sure they can easily sell 100,000 records, anything they put out, if you think worldwide. Yeah, of course. Uh, they, they, um, they've got a huge following. They still play the main stage at Reading quite a lot. Oh, yeah. They played the Coachella Festival a couple years ago. What, what I love about Jimmy Eat World as well is they just seem like they don't give a fuck. Like, they'll just kind of yeah. do what they they'll do what they want. Like they've always just written what they want and made a amazing uh, music. Um, yeah. They've never been cool. So they don't have to try and be cool. Yeah. They, they, they would just, they just, I think they just recognized as great songwriters. Yeah. It's, it's exactly, it's exactly it. They just really, really like making music and it's, it's all good music. I don't think I've ever like disliked anything that they've put out and they don't seem like obnoxious people either. They're just career musicians uh it's a, it's similar with there are a few other bands like that i'm I, again like i'm completely going blank right now but there are oh newfound glory that's the one i was thinking of uh and adam young from owl city and uh a while yeah. ago when when mark and travis had plus 44 they were doing yeah. a similar thing they they thought let's take our blink 182 money uh and let's have our own studio and yeah, they're very smart. And same with the Madden Brothers as well. Very, very smart songwriters. They write songs for other people as well, and then they get yeah. extra money that way. I think that's you know, that's where like um, Tim Armstrong, who was uh, lead singer and uh, guitarist, Rancid. Yeah, yeah, that dude is is very switched on. John Feldman also, who is Goldfinger. Yeah, he's, yeah. He's um, he he he's uh, amazing. I mean, I think Tim Armstrong wrote a Pink record. Yeah, amazing. Uh, I think he wrote Trouble, which is a really great pop song. It is a uh, great But it's just, you know, yeah. yeah, it just shows. It just shows how versatile he is as a writer, you know. Well, jo John Feldman signed The Used. Uh, yeah, was, who were a great band. Yeah, and that was a huge thing for him. And, you know, the, the record label didn't really trust him. They were like, are you sure? He was like, trust me, emo is like the next big thing. You then yeah. have The Used, Jimmy Eat World, My Chemical Romance from first to last. Uh, yeah, um, Mark and Travis... Uh, bought their own studio. Uh, Adam Young from Owl City bought his own studio. It's it's the it's the way to go, and that's why these days so many people are operating out of their home studios because it's just it's just the way to go, really. And and with today's technology and the fact that you can get GarageBand or Logic or Sonar or Reason or Cubase or, yeah. and Auto-Tune and everything. Some people I know, they don't even pay for it. They just like get a friend to like, you know, yeah. like send it to them as like a zip file. Oh man, so let's talk about, so all this time when your band was popping off, you were still living at home in, uh, in Hertfordshire, right? Yeah, I mean, we weren't really home that often. That was the crazy thing. Like, we were literally just touring, recording. Um, it was a crazy time. It kind of almost feels like another another lifetime, you know, because it's it was it was really weird. Like, we, you know, I never finished school. I literally like yeah. ended school and just went full time being a musician, like being a musician, like living the dream, um, which was fucking cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you never did the whole like move move to London, try and get a job at a record label, or be a songwriter or anything like that. No, so I mean, like afterwards, like I, I kind of after the band split up, I was kind of like, okay, you know, um, we just we like a few of us just started living in a little house in St Albans, nice. and just just I never I never wanted to work at a label. I was was like, you know, I'm an artist, you know. Um, I didn't, and but again, it's like I didn't think about the utility of doing those things. <laughs> probably would be a really good idea, like become a booking agent is probably a great idea or start promoting gigs. Um, you know, uh, there's all sorts of, there's all sorts of things, but then also like with age as well, with being a kid and, and not really like I, you know, bulk of the time being in VD, like I was too young to even be able to take a driving test. So some of the opportunities that were coming our way were really impossible to, do. like I remember like getting these like do you want a DJ at a club night or something and I was just like no not really like how would I get there no do you know what I mean whereas like maybe if I'd been 23 24 I'd just be like and and also that's the other thing like you go from just being at school like with your mates 
to just being paid to be in a band, you don't appreciate how amazing an opportunity this is. You just think, this is my life. This is what it's always going to be like. Eh, it'd be all right. Whereas like, that's, that's like, I'm not someone that has like regrets or whatever, but what I kind of, because at the end of the day, um, you know, and, and I, you know, I, I would, I would liken this to, um, there's a quote Dave Mustaine makes in the movie, Some Kind of Monster, like Dave Mustaine, for anyone who doesn't know, he's the, he's the lead singer and lead guitarist of Megadeth one of the most successful metal bands of all time. But he was the, like one of the original members of Metallica and he got kicked out of the band for, for you know, his, his alcoholism or whatever. And he taught, he's talking to, to Lars and he says, you know, it doesn't matter, like to a lot of people, my failure would be enormous success. So, you know, his failure to him is that he got kicked out of Metallica and he only ended up in Megadeth. And instead of being the guy who sold 150 million records, he only sold 10 million records. Do you know, do you know what I mean? And I kind of, I'm kind of like, well, I don't, I don't want to be bitter or upset because, you know, we were signed to a major, I met all of my heroes. We played great festivals that, you know, you remember fondly, you know, a lot of people would dream of, playing these these gigs and meeting these people and you know traveling to america to record an album and doing all this stuff and you know on one side i'm like oh well you know i didn't do as well as i maybe thought i could have done or whatever but at the same time you can't look at it negatively because you go well i'm saying that's a failure but to the vast vast majority 999 out of a thousand people that would be considered a massive a massive success do you, do you know like there aren't many people that have those those memories um, but my thing that I would say is I kind of, if I could change anything, it would have been to kind of get that opportunity when I was like 23, 24, when maybe, you know, you'd gone through uni and you'd had a shit job that you didn't really like for a few years, like, you know, um, so that then when you're like, shit, I'm making decent money being a recording artist, I would be like, I have got to hustle every fucking day to make sure that this never ends. Whereas when it's literally the first work experience you get, you're like, this is great. Yeah. I, you know, I can stay in my pants all day playing FIFA and the, the checks come, <laughs> you know? It's... Yeah. And then they had you like, you didn't have to do like the whole sleep in a van or sleep on people's floors or like Airbnb thing. It was like the, the worst, the worst we had, the worst we had was we had to share rooms in a travel lodge. Yeah, I think uh, I think um, I can imagine I can imagine that like the worst you had, uh, and whilst other light bands like hardcore bands and stuff, they're like sleeping in their vans. I, I think uh, which band is it? I can't remember who, but there are still bands who they're from New York or London, and they play gigs in Paris, and they'll be touring all the way from London to Paris. In, in uh, I experienced that. Don't get me wrong. That was Susie Hope. That was living in a splitter van for three months um like uh, and uh you know i'm a sucker for a budget like feeding feeding four five guys in a band on nine quid a day do you know what i mean it's like uh, do, do you know what i mean like proper di proper diy i mean it was great fun but yeah. it's harder to do that when you've you know when you've kind of like oh we've uh, we've got two days off in newcastle let's hire you know we'll get like a suite in a hotel and we'll just hang out there do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, yeah. whereas success where, is very subjective. That's the yeah, thing. exactly. <laughs> I, I, um, I, I, for anyone who doesn't know that the Dave Mustaine story actually gets mentioned in quite a lot of personal development and self-help books, actually about how. Oh, really? Yeah, it gets mentioned quite a lot. Uh, I think I was, oh, the re one I listened to re recently was called The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck. And he mentions that um, how, yeah, Dave Mustaine, he still kind of feels bummed out and hurt about that, even though he's, you know, headlining Download Festival or whatever. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it is a bit of a, a bummer. It, it all depends on your attitude. Like I, for example, like I have friends who are actors and if they get like a part in like a 15 minute short film or a play that's playing in a tiny 100 capacity theater some of them will be like yeah this is sick i'm working as an actor in london and then some of them will be like hey i did we will rock you like you know it's yeah, like, yeah you know it's one of those it's one of those things um 
but you, you still landed on your feet, didn't you? That's the most important thing. Yeah, you know, I, I uh, you know, I've never, I've never taken heroin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, I probably shouldn't make jokes about heroin, but uh, I mean, if you look at all of those guys, I mean, it didn't end well for people like, you know, uh, Lane Staley or Scott Whelan, but I mean, six pack for life. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that heroin look. That's, it's true. It's so true. Uh, we will talk about Just a Ride in a minute because, you know, that's what you're up to now you've got your band just a ride going on at the moment um but before we finish on the the vd stuff um what was your fondest tour memory and also one of the most random or exciting bands you toured with being signed to warner brothers i would have thought that maybe they would have thrown you in or lumped you in with maybe i don't know lincoln park or someone like that um okay so um Tour memories. I mean, we we were really lucky. Um, like one of the first ever sets of gigs. I think I mentioned this earlier that like, you know, sixteenth, seventeenth, eighteenth gig I ever did was at the Astoria, and we were opening on A's Hi Fi Serious tour. And like, I was a, I still am an enormous A fan, and 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 a real fan of um, Jason Perry now as a songwriter and a producer. I mean, he is mm -hmm. he is like top top level you know grammy winning as well i don't know if you know that yeah um, he's he is and they they i think he was doing stuff with mcfly and like all this cool stuff yeah yeah i think he just produced uh, don brocco's um latest album which is doing really well so he's he um, played download festival two weeks ago as well yeah 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 getting back into that so so yeah that was that was pretty awesome like getting on that tour um Rival schools were uh, the the main support, and I'm a huge Quicksand fan. So meeting Walter, um, who is just one of the nicest people you, you'll meet in in the industry, um, yeah, that was that was pretty cool. But um, I'm trying to think of like some crazy memories. We got banned from playing Newcastle University, which was pretty um, pretty rock and roll. Uh, all the best things happened in New Newcastle. Just loved us. I don't know what it was, but like to put it into perspective, most bands will play um, like their biggest show in London because London's the biggest market. But like, you know, the biggest tour we did, it's like a headline band. I think in London we played, we played the Garage, but when we did the Newcastle tour, we played like a thousand capacity venue and sold it out. It was fucking insane. So Newcastle just, you know, was, was the place to, to, to be for us. So yeah, we, um, we, we, I think we flooded some toilets or something like that. I think we had some like, some like weird, like explosives we put in the toilets and it ended up flooding them. And, and because it's the university as well, if yeah. you really damage the facilities, you're probably going to, um, probably going to, there's going to be more repercussions, I, I'll say, because, you know, you know, people that are going to gigs don't mind if the toilets are a bit trashed. But I think, you know, if you're, if you're trying to study, um, it's, it's probably a bit of a distraction. But that was that was uh, pretty awesome. It was. And I think actually what was really cool is the night before this big show we played in Newcastle, um, we we got there a day early and Alkaline Trio were playing the venue that we were playing. So we got to go and uh, and watch Alkaline Trio and, uh, and 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 hang out with them, which was which was pretty cool because they that, you know, Matt Skiba is one of my all time heroes, too. So that was that was pretty awesome um so yeah that would probably be be up there i think bands that we played with simple plan we did uh some shows with them which was which was cool it was us um as main support and a band called whitmore who we were kind of friends with so that was a that was a cool that was that was that was pretty cool i'm trying to think uh, weird bands that we, we kind of played with what venue was simple plan at because they were in 2005 really big and uh, they, but I don't think they weren't like Wembley Stadium big. But no, they, they were more like Astoria Brixton big. Yeah, so this was this was on the no pads, no helmets, just balls ah. tour. So what was really weird actually was they were fucking huge in America, and they didn't quite that record um, didn't 
didn't do so well in England. It was kind of more of like a sleeper hit. Like everyone knew who Simple Plan were, but it was, I think it was still not getting any, was the, the big one. That was the one in 2005 that was I just fucking huge. I just on the same CD actually. Both your bands. Oh yeah. You were both on the CD, which I discovered you on. I remember I was watching the Extreme Sports television channel. Yeah. And they, said they were like, go and pick up our new CD. And it had in the trailer, the, the TV advert, it had, I'd do anything. I wish yeah. I was a girl. She's going to break soon by... Um, Less than Jake. Less than Jake. Sabbath, Bloody Sabbath by uh, Black Sabbath, obviously. And Skate to Hell by Gangrene. Those were like the five songs in the... Yeah, and uh, that was... That summer was huge for music because I believe in a thing called Love by the Darkness as well. Um, I think yeah, yeah. That, that summer. That's... So I, I can imagine that it, it was when Shut Up uh, came out. Yeah. That was the single which made Simple Plan go very big in the UK. You know, they supported Avril Lavigne. Yes. Um, did you know, do you know who produced Still Not Getting Any? Uh, it was Mark Hoppus, wasn't it? No, it was Bob Rock who did oh. all the Metallica stuff. Yeah. Oh, it's, right. I, I thought, for some reason, I've all, I thought Mark Hoppus produced one of their albums because, but it could. Just he did be... the guest vocal on. He did the guest vocal on "I'd Do Anything." There but yeah, so so Simple Plan was a crazy one because when we were recording the album in America, Simple Plan were everywhere and they were so huge. And the gig we the we when we played with them in London, we played the Electric Ballroom, which isn't a huge gig. Yeah, you know they they just for 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 whatever reason their label didn't really push them on that on that record in the UK. But it might have just been that they were blowing up so much in America that it was like, let's just concentrate concentrate there. I think it may also have something to do with them being a Canadian band because, uh, you, you know, maybe that maybe ha they have uh, different priorities. Funny you mentioned Avril Lavigne because uh, Whitmore, they, they were the opening act for Avril Lavigne. And I think they got kicked off the tour after two days because they got her really pissed. <laughs> oh, no, yeah, because yeah, of the drinking age in the UK. Uh, that's it's so funny, like all of these. Because yeah, uh, the Electric Ballroom, a lot of bands have played there, like We the Kings and Blink One Eighty Two and stuff. Played there before they got really big. Um, was there ever any talk of you to like to go and do a big, massive supporting US tour? Because asking Alexandria, for example, they're an example of a and Bring the Horizon again. That's an example of two British bands who, the way that the music industry works, I think, is like, if you're big in England, you're big in England. And if you're big in France, you might also get big in England or something like that. Or if you're big in England, you could also get big in Japan. But if you go to America and you break America, oh yeah, that's like an umbrella that trickles down everywhere. Was there never any talk about like, just trying to like, just, just put you there and like, go big there. <laughs> no, so we, because we were signed, like officially we were signed to London Records, which is like owned by Warners and, uh, and whatever, they, you know, the, the territory, like you will tend to only get pushed in America if you're successful in the UK. You know what I mean? Like, so that's where the, that's where the cycle can go. In terms of like big tours, there was one, that, I mean, there was a few that were quite funny. We were meant to tour with the Donners. I don't know if you remember them. Yeah. They were a pretty wicked girl band, but we got kicked off the tour like with a week, a week before it was meant to start because they listened to our songs and thought we were sexist, oh, which yeah. was quite funny. I mean, whoever put that tour together, like knowing that they were kind of like, you know, strong women, like, or whatever, like that was their, that was really their thing to have an opening band that had a song called I Wish You Was A Girl that could be seen in you know derogatory terms was thought, probably not great right i thought that'd be great you were both punk rock bands you both had similar music you're yeah i i would have loved to i would have loved that because I, I really that record i can't uh, i think the record is called the donna's stay the night it's a yeah. fantastic record there's a, a song called um shake it off or something um which is which is a fucking banger um and I'm I'm a huge Kiss fan, and they had done the uh, they had done a cover of Strutter for Detroit Rock City soundtrack. So yeah. I was the, I just wanted to ask them about like oh because I think Kiss were in the video for that. I was like oh my god you got to meet Kiss you know because that's the other thing as well. It's like that that's one of the other things I think was really difficult about Vine Delight um, because of the age we were, right? 
that you know the scene is all about networking you know and it isn't a um it shouldn't come as a shock to people that like you know papa roach and alien ant farm were really tight you know my chemical romance and a use really tight and it's like um blink 182 and jimmy world there was a there was a connection there was a connection that uh tom DeLong was a massive fan of jimmy world and i think i think jimmy world actually played his wedding and sugar uh, as well he liked him and sugar yes, well. yes so so you know bands make friends and it's like well they're going to open for us or that do you, do you know what i mean yeah. one of the really difficult things for us was we were kids you yeah. know and um what we found is we made friends with the older bands the bands who like um like uh the guys from rival schools yeah you know walter was like looking after us like an uncle do you know what i mean like whereas because he was mature he'd been through it he was in his mid-30s then do you know what i mean and maybe a band that were 21 22 23 would think i don't want to hang out with a bunch of 15 16 year olds and would also go they don't have to lift their gear how did they get on a major do you know what i mean like because they're looking at it in a different in a different way and maybe rightfully so I, I don't know but we didn't form those kind of bonds and relationship like we got on really well with a um like dan carter who's now like the king of radio one rock show like yeah. you know he was he was a really really like great guy hung out with him a load on the tour you know over over the next few years would see him at gigs and hang out and whatever and he was he was cool but like there were other bands who just they just decided they didn't like we were just kids it's like fuck off do you, do you know what i mean it was like it was just one of what one of those one of those things you know yeah, um that's... which again is is tough because you you can't hang out like and also as well you can't even go to a bar like the only, like because you're all underage yeah you can't true. socialize with people afterwards you know in america yeah unless you're doing something like the warp tour which again like it, the warp tour was only really just finding its feet and these, these days like 2010 to 2018 things like warp tour slam dunk festival these things are a common occurrence and the, uh, yeah the one in australia the one in japan as well yeah um, big day out in australia that's like yeah exactly these things are pretty normal now whereas back then you were they were less of like this huge thing this huge the thing. other thing Thanks. the other thing though is that now right um bands have access to their their data they have access to analytics that tell them where the audience is so do you know if if let's say back in Vine the light days there's potentially some gigs there's a festival in australia well unless it's gone to radio in australia no one would have heard of us whereas yeah. now it's like you know you put your music out there you can have fans in australia and if you've got enough fans in australia you can potentially put a pretty good pitch towards why you should go and play that gig yeah of course. Do, 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 do you know what i mean there was one tour actually that unfortunately it all fell apart which was a real fucker for us um and again it was it was the power of the labels so the tour was meant to be the used glass jaw and violent delight glass jaw. But, <laughs> um but um daryl's um health wasn't there and uh -huh. it, it you know it i mean it didn't even get announced like it was this was being put together you know it was going to be good sized venues i think it would have been like brixton sort of size yeah. but then he, his his crohn's disease was just really flaring up and uh -huh. it got pulled even before it got announced but that you know it's little things like that that was um those are things actually there's one thing actually that i think is really interesting about kind of vd and and about getting to that next level and one of the most weird things about this was um top of the pops right at the time top of the pops was the music show yeah. and the format for top of the pops in those days was it was the number one single uh -huh. and i think the five highest new entries in the chart but there was a caveat on that and that was if any song moved up either within or into the top 10, that would supersede the last place, right? right? And that just never happened because in those days, it was pretty much like 
the week you go in the highest is pretty much the first week. And you might stay in the chart, but you'll stay in the chart and you'll slowly move down. I was going to ask about top of the pops because that if you were number 25, I would have thought that with all the Pepsi top 40 or whatever, you would be. Yeah. So we would we would have been if, if it had been any other week, we would have been on top of the pops that week. And we were already like we were preparing to be on top of the pops. We were going to play in dresses. Wow. Like it was going to be just like the bit, like just like the video. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you like as just like a TV event, I think that would have really grabbed the attention. You know, it's like X rated. There are a bunch of teenagers. They're a punk band. They're cross dressing. Like that would have probably been a big kind of media event. But that week, um, uh, what was the song? Uh, um, Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous went from uh -huh. number 12 to number seven. Fucking and that bumped us because we were the fifth highest new entry in the chart. And it was like, so we got in the new, so the worst thing about it, right, was we got, when, when we found out we were number 25, it was like champagne was popping, like we're going to be on top of the pops. And about half an hour later, somebody pointed out, oh shit, they're not, you're not going to be on top of the pops because look, they've uh, gone up. It's, it's... And we were even, and we didn't even know straight away because we were unsure if Good Charlotte would be in the country. So maybe it would default back to us. But yeah, it turned out because they hadn't done, that was the first time they'd ever been on top of the pops. It was worth them flying back to the, to the UK to do. Yeah. They, so they, it was like, they had the song Little Things, which was on the Dude Where's My Car soundtrack. But then Lifestyles of the Rich and the Famous was there. It was for another else, level. Followed yeah. by the anthem Girls and Boys. Oh, yeah. And, and Oh man, I mean, if you're gonna get knocked off by any band, then it may as well be yeah. Good Charlotte, and especially as around the time, same time you had like Daniel Bedingfield and Usher, and like all these. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like... Well, it would have been, and then this is the other thing about like putting the, the program together. There's like you got two punk bands, like in those days, rock bands didn't get on, so just Good Charlotte being on was a big thing for. Yeah. for those for those sort of acts because if you actually look at like where where songs charted even huge bands bands like the foo fighters would get 35 40 do you know what i mean like it yeah, isn't yeah. it you know but a few years later a few years later you'd get like green day going in top five you yeah. know yeah. i personally think a lot of that is down to the success of busted to be honest i, I think th it got people ready for more mainstream for for you know, younger kids who might, who, you know, they get into busted. And this, I, I quite, I think as writers, um, at like thinking about it purely on a songwriting level and whatever, they're incredibly well written songs. Like they, they're great. And you could have made them a bit more punky, but they just went a different route. They went like, well, let's do more. You know, I wouldn't even say it was like teeny bopper. It's like preteen. That's that was their market. But then those kids, a few years later, American Idiot comes out. Boom, it works. Well, I think uh, James Bourne, I've done quite a, few, a couple of videos about him on, on my channel, how about how he is such a fantastic songwriter and how Son of, oh, Dork, yeah. Son of Dork should have been bigger, but he was doing a lawsuit um, with ex-members of Busted and stuff. And yeah, they, they'd certainly paved the way because they broke out in 2002, which is only, I, they actually broke out more or less eight or nine months after Take Off Your Pants and Jacket by Blink-182 yep. came out. And Blink-182 were the only band who were producing mainstream pop punk hits. Some people were kind of into Limp Bizkit. They kind of had a bit of a mainstream limelight and maybe Alien Ant Farm did the Smooth Criminal cover. And like those, yep. those things trickling through the woodwork. But I think Busted... Uh, and a little bit of Sum 41 and a bit of, especially Good Charlotte, because Good Charlotte were, they weren't just pop punk, they were basically mainstream pop rock. Yeah, yeah. They, they, these bands. I think the first album, the first album, the self-titled was pop punk. Yeah. But I think Lifestyles, uh, uh, was it, no, The Young and the Hopeless, yeah. even the way that it's recorded sounds like a pop record. Yeah. The, it the... doesn't sound, it doesn't sound, you know, it doesn't sound like, um, like the self-titled record it has a much cleaner radio sort of sound do you, you, you know what I mean it's like which now is kind of is more modern and you know it would 
it, it probably now gets remembered as like more of a pop punk album. But I think in those days it did, it did stand out. Because like, if you look at like, um, the, you know, Fall Out Boy, Panic at the Disco, you know, that kind of, like the next wave of stuff that came out, it was more sounding like um, the, the Young and the Hopeless, I think, is sonically. And uh, also like pop punk is now probably one of the biggest alternative genres, but back then, like you, Bowling for Soup were just getting their start and, and things like yeah. that. And, uh, you know, pop punk was basically a baby back then. And I think Busted sort of almost copying Blink-182's formula and Good Charlotte basically writing pop punk song or pop songs, uh, it really brought it to the masses. And, you know, now it's one of the biggest genres and therefore you then had My Chemical Romance and then you had Fall Out. Yeah. And yeah, it's... Uh, it's, it's not how it worked. I tell you, talking about like problematic songs, I, I, um, I mean, what I go to school for, is that a song about a young boy that's being groomed by a sexual predator? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's a song about a guy who has a crush on his teacher, goes to her house and stares at her through the window, and then eventually one day gets her in private and they hook up and it's and then she leaves her job i think yeah. possibly husband to run away with this teenage boy it yeah. i mean there are there are court cases about stuff like this when it happens in real life people end up on registers it's I, uh, it was a different world it was just like yeah i know but don't take it so seriously it's just a bit of fun exactly it's the same way i was watching the movie rush hour recently and there's a scene where chris tucker's character handcuffs jackie chan to the steering wheel and he goes wah afterwards and like you wouldn't you wouldn't do that these days you wouldn't be able to go wah because it would be offensive yeah. but it's so it's so funny yeah i i really honestly i think the, the label really fucked up there but with you because a should have tried to send you to do tours in america that's a big massive thing punk rock and pop punk was so big over there in 2002 and 2003 and b should not have fucked with your <laughs> your album and left you to your own devices a bit more in my opinion it sounds like well the album's great and then the songs that you released after violent delight wasn't going anymore were great there was no well, I think well, one of the things that I, I've always thought, I just thought like, if the, if the album had come out after I wish it was a girl, like people buy out, like for me, right, back in the day, I mean, it's, dif it's different now, but you really get into bands when you have the album. Do you know what I mean? Like you buy single, like back in the day, it's you, you buying a single was probably like you listening to a tune on a playlist. Mm. You know, that's the kind of level it was. That was the level of commitment because like a single was like a pound and yeah. like you just listen to the song and it's like, yeah, I can have that. And you probably lose the CD in two weeks. You know, do you know what I mean? Like, um, but I just kind of felt like if, if we just drop, if they just gone, fuck it, just drop the fucking album and just, just capitalize on the wish it was a girl buzz. I think that a lot of the people that bought the single would have gone and bought the album because the, the wish it was a girl single sold a lot of singles because mm -hmm. you know i was talking about like um album sales and whatever sales were high back in the early 2000s like to get in the top 25 you were selling tens of thousands of singles oh. so i would have i would have said like okay let's say one in three people had fucked off the single and just bought the album do you know like I, that's that to me would be a bit of a game changer or like you know i don't like if we'd sold the number of albums that the single sold we we probably would have kept our deal <laughs> like you yeah, know but, but again you know it's just it's just you know i i would i just think of myself like even if i knew a band and i had, had two sales of theirs i might not buy the ticket to go and see them live but if i had their album i definitely would do you know like the main benefit to buying a single was also really only getting the b-side whereas when you buy the album like you get so much more than that as well I, yeah. I remember it was very very rare for people in my friendship group to buy singles we would usually just go in and get the album which i yeah. miss you know i miss uh, i miss doing that and you're right maybe it would have been different but then again 
maybe the single might not have done as well if the album came straight out and then there might have been yeah. a paradox there as well so who who knows there's no certain answer but i certainly think they should have at least uh they should have at least pushed you in in, in other countries as well because i know that like japan and america would have gone so nuts for that kind of stuff yeah we really wanted to go to japan because our drummer was japanese oh. and that was like his thing he wanted to play fuji rock yeah and like yeah you know and everyone wants to be big in japan you know it's like another yeah. world yeah japan and uh, indonesia are incredible incredible markets uh i lived in indonesia for a year and the gigs they have there and the music scene is so cool like it's all yeah coolest music scene I've ever seen. So uh, as we, we've been talking for like an hour and a half, <laughs> yeah. let's, let's wrap up. Um, let everyone just know what you're up to these days with Just A Ride. Uh, if people want to go and check out your Instagram, you've got some really cool introduction videos on there saying why each member joined the band and what it's all about. But it's, it's you know, it's a straight up, it's a straight up rock band, sort of like a hard, hard rock rock band. Um, and you've got some good releases already and you're on youtube and they can find you on youtube and instagram and facebook i mean and stuff but um just quickly yeah tell us what you've been up to for the last 15 years i guess um and the <laughs> idea behind starting uh just the ride and um yeah the um, the the reason for the change in not direction but i guess the change in, in sound or what you know what you're writing these days Okay, cool. So just to write, I guess, I guess kind of after Susie Hope, I kind of was like pretty burnt out from the, the music industry. And, um, you know, I never, like, like I said, I never finished school. Um, and like, I ended up, I ended up kind of going the route a lot of like creatives or like a lot of musicians do, which is just like, get a job in a bar, get a job in a restaurant and just kind of just work because it's flexible. Do you know what I mean? It's like lots of, lots of like, you know, it's one of these jobs where, you know, the more hours you work, the more money you make, which is, you know, and, and it was actually a cool time because I got to meet actually loads of musicians and, you know, really interesting, interesting people and whatever. But by the time that like I decided to call it time on um, on on music or, or just go, do you know what? I kind of like had two choices. It was like, should I finish my studies or should I like just continue working in you know, in hospitality and, um, you know, just try and make, make a go of, uh, of this. And I ended up actually like just sticking with, sticking with hospitality. And, uh, I ended up like in, you know, kind of like, uh, specializing in opening restaurants. So I kind of did that for about 10 years, like, um, worked for, worked for some really cool companies, worked with some really, really great people. Um, uh, met my wife, which was amazing. Um, so yeah, I was kind of doing that. And then, and then it was, it's really weird actually, because I then obviously sort of started having like new friendship groups and, you know, I, you know, cause I was, I was moving, I was in London and then I was kind of traveling around and, you know, I had this whole group of friends who never really saw me as a guy who did music at all. Um, you know, they, they saw me as the guy who, you know, whenever there's a work night out and we end up in karaoke is like really enthusiastic about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so um, we, so probably, it's probably quite a while ago now, probably about five years ago, actually, um, Drew, who's a guitarist in Just A Ride, who was the, the, the guitarist, um, who was the replacement guitarist for Tom in, in um, Vine Delight. Yep. He, out of the blue just sent me some messages on facebook messenger and i remember i was walking home and i was actually pretty drunk <laughs> um and he was just like oh rod uh i've got this project it's like i've been writing songs i think your voice would be really really good for it why the fuck aren't you doing music you dickhead like give it a go and i was like i was a little bit tanked up so i was like yeah, man, why don't I fucking do it? Yeah, so I was just like, yeah, cool. Send me, send me the tracks. And he sent me, he basically sent me a, um, it was like a backing track, um, but an entire song. It wasn't like, here's a riff. It was like, this is the structure of the song that I've written, but Drew just doesn't, he's just not a guy that does vocals and melody and, and stuff, like, stuff like that. 
And I remember playing it to my wife and she was like, there is no way you'll be able to sing on this because it's just too heavy for you. You know what I mean? Because like, you know, I, I am more of a like pop punk kind of guy, uh, you know? Yeah. So it was she was like, this is really heavy. But I had some ideas for like how, how you would do, how you could do it with like my range and my style and whatever. And I sent it back to Drew and he was like, man, this is really, really cool. Like, can I send you some more stuff? Should we, should we do this? And Just to Ride actually just started as a bit of like a songwriting project. Like for me, it was, it wasn't even like, let's start a band or whatever. It was just like, yeah, actually I really enjoyed putting it, putting it together. And it was actually, to be fair, it was actually, um, there was Drew, it was a guy called Eddie Hoffman, who was our original bass player, who unfortunately he had to move back to Brazil for like family reasons. Um, but like the three of us were kind of writing, you know, doing this kind of writing thing. And eventually once we had sort of five or six songs, we were like, well, let's kind of find a drummer and let's maybe, let's maybe, let's maybe do this. Not like super, super serious or whatever, but just like, it's a cool thing to do. Yeah. And I think what's interesting about like the sound that came out is, um, is it, it, it was this kind of like grungy sort of sound, you know? very, very much in the vein of bands like, I guess, like Stone Temple Pilots, yep. um, maybe Alice in Chains. And what was really interesting is like back in the day, our, um, Vine the Lights manager and our drummer, um, our drummer Ken was a little bit older. Um, mm -hmm. So I think at the time, like, so when he, when I was 15, he was 23. So he's like eight years older. Wow. So he was really into the grunge thing. Yeah, he's Japanese. So he looked younger, so he could yeah. fit in. Um, <laughs> and also as well, like punk drummers tend to be the oldest in the band. Because you have to be a bit older, usually, to play that fast to have the strength, unless you're an exceptional drummer. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he'd always said, like, oh, I think you... He'd always said, like, oh, I think you sound, like, a little bit like the dude from Alice in Chains, like my style of singing. And I was like, well, I wasn't... We actually, crazily enough, you talk about weird bands we played with and supported. Like, we did a support slot for Jerry Cantrell's solo act. That was weird. Really? I had no fucking idea who he was. Literally none. That's so funny. Like, and, and like, our drummer was like, sh like, couldn't even go, like, because, like, he, I, I don't want to sound stereotypical, but, like, he is, he is very Japanese and there's very much like the hierarchy and there's the respectfulness and, like, he wouldn't even go and say to the guy, I'm a big fan. Yeah. Like, cause it was like, it would, oh no, no, that's not my place, place to do that. So that was like a weird, a weird person we played with and didn't really appreciate. Like now I would look back and I go, why the fuck didn't I just talk to him? Like, he's a legend. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so we ended up with this sort of like, this sort of like um, grungy sound. And then, then loads of things just sort of happened that stopped us from really taking it ser seriously. I... I basically got like a hospitality project to do in the Netherlands. So I went for a year to do that. And we kind of carried on like, again, writing and doing bits and whatever. And I think we actually shot a music video at that time. Um, but it wasn't ever like a huge, a huge thing. And at that time, Drew got the opportunity um, to rejoin the band Inglorious. I don't know if you know those guys, but they're, they're doing pretty, pretty, pretty well in like the kind of classic rock kind of circles and so he was I think he was in Inglourious for like 18 months um and they played some pretty huge gigs like they toured with with some epic bands like they they did a few tours with like Steel Panther and no. they played they played some really big fest you know like Download and um I'm trying to think what the, there's a really big festival in, in France. Um, Hellfest? like a big rock for Hellfest. Yeah. yeah. And like, man, he was sending me the pictures and it's just like, Oh my God, like so many people, I think they might've done like rock, rock and ring, like all that sort of stuff. So, you know, they, they were doing that, but then, um, then I came back from Holland. Um, but then at that time, that's when Eddie's, uh, I think it was his grandmother was very ill and, and he had to go back to Brazil. So then that kind of slowed us down. Um, and we kind of, I think it was probably like 2019, we, we, we kind of decided, oh, you know what, let's, let's maybe give this a go. There's good songs here. Let, let's try this. And, and weirdly enough, the guy who shot the music video for us, Russ, um, he was a bass player. He was, actually in a, he was actually for a short while in the band Earth Tone 9. I don't know if you remember those guys. They were like a new met, British new metal-y band. So then we were like, yeah, fuck, let, let's, let's try and 
let's try and take this a little bit more seriously. And we were building momentum and then COVID happened and we were like, oh, uh -huh. fuck. But one of the great things was, is because it was a songwriting project and because I'd gone to Holland, it was all done remotely anyway. So we were quite used to this sending ideas. And then like COVID happened and we were like, I just had a bit of a brainwave because at that point I'd kind of moved away from hospitality and I was working in, so I, I work in like, I, I, um, I run a creative agency with my, with my sister and we do a lot of work in social media. So we manage, so that's kind of like social media, um, you know, making content for social media and that sort of thing is kind of, it's kind of my job. Um, so I was like, Oh shit, like this might actually work out because with the pandemic and everything, I was like, there's one thing that really builds your following more than anything, right? More than viral videos, it's playing live gigs and it's just getting out there and meeting people yeah. because there's a big difference between gaining a follower and making a real connection with somebody. And, you know, I think when you see a band live and you feel like you discovered it, that's when you can really start to say that you love that band. Yeah. Do you know, like you have to take everything with a pinch of, pinch of salt and I, and I kind of like when I look at like just a ride social stuff and whatever the only one I'm really paying attention to in terms of follower count is probably Spotify because I think like when you follow a band on Spotify that's a real commitment like a lot of people don't even know that they can follow bands on Spotify so generally speaking your followers are actually really into you so that's the that's the real one that you 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 want to look at of course it's always great to get in, like grow your Instagram following and do all those things because there are benefits that come from you know, growing your following, of course. Um, but um, I kind of felt that we had an opportunity um, to really make headway as a band because nobody can tour. So what we can do is if we start taking the social media seriously, what we could basically do is maybe release an album, maybe even because I, I, I was one of the people who thought like it would be 18 months, two years before everything gets back to normal. And people said I was crazy, but I'm kind of being proved right. Um, so my thing was like, we could basically essentially put out two albums. And if, if the only way you can discover music is on socials, like it's an, it's a level playing field now, you know? So, um, it was like, that was the incentive we needed to like hammer out, finish the album. And, and we, we booked in to record the album when we had that little break in the pandemic. So literally the day that we could be you know, go and do some stuff. We were in the studio, we recorded this album, we did 10 tracks. Um, and uh, we've got, we've got it down now. We had a bit of a nightmare, like finishing it off. There, there was like, um, there was just, you know, when you're, again, when you're not, when you haven't got a major label backing you and you're kind of doing things on a bit of a shoestring budget, you know, you're, you're, you're working with people that are probably doing stuff on mates rates and whatever, and they've got bills to pay. So when, you know, the, the, you know the big paying jobs come in you kind of get pushed to the back a little bit you know it's there's like no hard feelings over it it's it's life it's business you know if you've got you've got a, a label paying you i don't know twenty thousand quid to do an album or you've got your mates who you're doing it for two grand yeah yeah you, you know when deadlines come in like you've got to pay the bills you've got to like and you've got to think about your career and stuff like that and stuff like that so we ended up with like the record was done but it wasn't mixed and um then you know in a bit of a sense of desperation we just kind of sent out these emails to like our favorite mixers our dream mixers on the off chance that someone might reply and uh, uh i think i mentioned at the beginning like th this guy chris sheldon so he um he's a really great mixer he's worked uh he mixed the color and the shape for foo fighters um he's done he did pretty much all the feeder records um, it, I think he did the first four Biffy Clyro records, uh, Block Party, Skunk and Nancy. So, do you know, like he, he was like the guy for us, like his sound was just, this is what, this is what we want. Um, and, and yeah, we had him, we, we were talking to him about potentially doing the VD record, but there were scheduling conflicts and didn't happen. And I was talking to Chris about it and he was like, I remember that. Fuck. Yeah. You know, I lost out on the fucking money for that. Cheers, mate. <laughs> But we reached out to Chris and, and Chris was like, I really love the record. I want to do it. And then it was like, he was like, yeah, let's talk about money. And he told us how much it would cost. And we were like, there's no way we can afford that. So he came back to us and said, what could you afford? We said a number and he said, okay, I've got some, I've got a window of opportunity. I want to do it. it. It's worth my while to do it. So we've got this amazing record mixed by, you know, one of our favorite guys. One of the, one of the cool little things as well that happens too 
is like when you work with a mixer, what you'll often do when you send them the track is they'll say, could you send me a song that you like sonically, just as a reference point to kind of where you want the track to go. And we sent him this song and he was like, oh, is that a joke? And I was like, well, why? He's like, I mixed that. Really? So you're like, oh, this is amazing. This is so, so cool. Um, so yeah, you know, um, so we've got this record, we're really happy with it. And yeah, now I guess we're just doing, we're just like um, meeting loads of, bands uh, you know networking with people just thinking about how you do things in 2021 um one of the things i have noticed actually is there are more and more bands that are forming that are around our age and i think that's actually a really interesting thing and and, and i think the pandemic as horrible as it has been has reawakened the creative side of a lot of people who have a lot of talent and maybe just just you know their job their life had just moved in a way that they didn't think it was as important to them as it was do you know and like i think when terrible things happen you really reevaluate and uh, you know we've met some really interesting bands so there's a great kind of like they're the danish oasis uh, i think they're a band called dead star talk um and uh, they're leading a christian like he works in the industry uh, he runs a big agency and he was like during the pandemic everything shut down he was like i'm gonna write some songs and he's written you know with with the guys in the band they've written this great album and you know they're putting out you know yeah we're, we're probably a little bit old we're kind of all dad rockers but i think there is something amazing about like you know somebody who somebody who has played music for 20 years is going to write a very different record to a teenager who's just all raw and i think there's a place for both but i think before the pandemic the industry was really focused just on that kind of raw talent you know um and again there's other bands there's a, there's a great kind of like grunge duo called attendant who i think that they're, they're 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 making some really great tunes they're more similar to us in style but you know they're they're getting the attention of like a lot of the spotify editorial lists um you know there's an american band we know called ultra apex again similar sort of age the pandemic really was like well i've got all this time what am i going to do it's like well, i'm going to write music about it because that's what that's what i used to do when you know, you go through really difficult times and, and, you know, they were really uncertain times. Like, I don't know how it was for you, but like there were periods early on where I was like, shit, is, is this it? Like, where is it going to go? And I'm sure everybody around the world at some point felt like that, you know, and, you know, for people that either have always written or used to write, I think it probably was a defense mechanism to go, Hey, do you know what? I'm gonna write some songs about it. Cause that's, that's what I used to do when I was a teenager, when I was feeling, like this and you know it's great a great kind of uh, a great kind of experience and i think there's going to be like i said there's like there's going to be this explosion of maybe older older musicians kind of that have probably got a lot to offer getting back in and and you know because the industry will change you know it, it, you know all power to the all power to them you know um so yeah so that's kind of where we are we're doing that whole release a new song every six weeks because people don't buy albums anymore um and I'm putting into practice a lot of what I've learned working in social media and uh, it, you know, it all works. Um, it, it just takes persistence, I think. And, and I think, you know, it's great. It's a great, there are pros and cons of the way the music industry has changed. But I do think that if you have a good product and you are willing to put in the effort and maybe learn some new tricks, you can get your music out to a huge number of people. Um, and, you know, our aim, listen, we're not spring chickens anymore, but like our aim is like, look, we love music, right? I'll do it regardless. Um, but I think, you know, rather than thinking we're going to be Bon Jovi, I think like the goal would be to say, look, do you know, um, uh, if we can monetize this band, even to a point where a fraction of what we would spend on doing our hobby comes in, that's amazing. Do you know, and we already do. We're already selling merchandise, selling downloads, uh, you know, and it's every little bit helps, so, you know, especially if you're going to do it anyway. Yeah, uh, we look at you know, like uh, Wheatus, for example, and uh, they're, they're actually on tour right now and they released one of their album via a just pay what you want scheme. Yeah. Um, and they did a live stream a couple of weeks ago in New York. They're currently, I think, in Pittsburgh or somewhere touring with Huberstank. So, it's uh and, and yellow card as well their final album they released it when they were about the same age as you are now and with youtube 
and Spotify and whatever, Deezer and uh, Instagram or, or anything really. Like we now have Instagram TV even. So you can, yep. at a push of a button in a few minutes, you can upload it anywhere. You can record it at your own house. You get 10,000 views on just your music video. Then that's 30 dollars which i know isn't much split between like four adds up it adds up exactly you do that um every single week or like the thing another thing that some people are doing is they might do like a live acoustic session and then the next week do that and then they're each getting fifty thousand views then they'll do a twitch stream and then they'll do like a, a live gig or a live stream gig and there's you know like you said monetizing it. it's not like you you know, have to be the next Biffy Clyro or like, or something like that, like be like headlining download festival. But there's no reason that like, there's other bands say, similar age. There's like, who am I thinking like airborne and stuff like there's, there's yeah. bands around, there's bands around who are playing the gigs, playing the festival circuits, um, playing supporting slots. Um, and, but what you said earlier, you said something earlier, which actually struck a chord. And that was that, um, seeing a band live, uh, it still gives you the sentimental connection to the band. Yeah. Um, because there are a lot of bands I like. I like Crown the Empire and Miss May I and Of Mice and Men, and Amity Affliction, but I have a more solid connection with Crown the Empire and the Amity Affliction because I've seen them live the most times. And uh, there's just something very, very exciting about that that makes you almost want to listen to them more like maybe i might listen to miss may i every once in a while but i've never seen them live and watching their videos on youtube i'm like yeah it's cool and everything but like i don't think i would get the same excitement like you know i think i think as well it's like i don't know if you get this but like seeing bands grow right mm -hmm. like i i'm a massive alkaline trio fan and i think the first time i saw them i can't remember that it was like somewhere like the bar fly yeah. And then I saw them play like the electric, uh, like the LA2. And then I saw them play the electric ballroom. And then I saw them play the Astoria. And then I saw them play Bricks and Cat. Do you know what I mean? So I feel like I've, gr like I have so many memories of seeing them. Do you, do, you, do you know what I mean? And it's like, and you know, now, I mean, now it's, it's the, you know, I'm sure if they played, they would play some pretty even though it's many years later, they'll probably still play some decent, decent venues. Cause like obviously Matt Skeever's in Blink-182 now. So he's, you know, our plan have probably opened up to, to um, a wider audience, but you know, having those memories, do you know, that, that would, that makes me go whenever, if ever I get, a, and, and it's, and it's a really weird thing now because I remember, uh, I would, I'd assume you treat it exactly like me that, you know, you're probably from that generation that, you know, Kerrang magazine or NME every single week. And you would, you would know six months out that Green Day are releasing their new record. Whereas, yeah. you know, when you're older and you've got different responsibilities, it's just all of a sudden you get this alert on your phone. It's like, Ooh, Green Day have a new record on Spotify. Like, well, that's yeah. nice. But it's like, I'm going to listen to that Green Day record all the way through all the way through because I have that connection, that sentimental connection with, uh, with, with the band. But I think it's interesting. Like, I think the way that, um, the way that industry is changing and, 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 you know, I think that you are going to get less massive bands, right? Mm. But I think the way people like to kind of, I guess, digest entertainment and whatever is they like the connection. And it's like, you know, now with us, with our Instagram following, you know, we've got, we've got a fair, fairly decent community of people who you know the talk that you know they'll, they'll send us a message every time we post and you'll, you'll talk to people almost on a like every other day or whatever and you're starting to build these connections with with people and it's like you know people go like well why would someone listen to your band who've got a relatively small profile and it's like could you imagine like being like being go, go back go back to like when we were young and could you imagine if like you could just text some 41 and Derek Wibley would text you back. Yeah. You, it's, That's pretty it's, fucking cool. And, and you know, and then, and then maybe a week later, Derek could send you, Oh, this is a, this is a song I'm working on. What do you think? Like, and what I think is going to happen is there are going to be less huge bands, but there are going to be more bands that are sustained by a, a you know, a, a group of, of fans, because like I said, there are so many bands that will, because everything's got cheaper you need less money to carry on doing it yeah. like you, you, you know like if you could um you 
you know, if you could every year raise three grand from a fan base, right? You could probably, you could probably make a record. Like, yeah. do, you, do you know what I mean? Like that's, that's ha- like, and, and, and depending on, and this is where I think it, it suits older bands. Cause as you get older, you get better at playing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And this is the, this is, this is the thing. Like, um, I, I, you know, I, I, you know, I, I sometimes do vocal sessions and stuff for people on the site or whatever. And my thing is, if you get me in to do a session, you'll get your stuff done in 15 minutes. Do you know what I mean? Because I know how to record. I know this. I don't, I, I, I I'll, I'll, I'll know exactly what I'm doing. Right. I, I'll have learned my part. I can sing in time. That's a big one that singers, a lot of young singers. Now, if I go back to when I recorded the VD record, my God, it must have, you know, some songs were taking, you know, three days to record, not 15 minutes, half an hour. Do you know what I mean? Now think about the cost. You yeah. have to go to the studio at that time. You have to do that. So like older bands can go, yeah, I can smash it out. You know, like our, our, like our guitarist Drew, he's, I mean, he's a, like an elite level session player. He, he plays in Culture Club. You know, he does, you know, he's records on stuff. Uh, it's funny you mentioned We Will Rock You. He was a guitar player on We Will Rock You um, and guitar player on, um, on um, uh, Rock of Ages. So like, it's not like, you know, when we were in VD where, or, or when I was in Susie Hope where we're like, okay, right, fuck, you know, right, okay, you know, there's only so many songs we can do. When you literally are a session player and you're like, yeah, cool, I'll, I'll bash that out. Yeah, you know, a bunch of like twenty-year-olds, like you know, you're gonna fuck up a lot, and then you've got absolutely a, you've got like hotels to think about, and then like traveling to and from the studio and studio time and produ- exactly producers, mixers, engineers, like everything. Yeah, um, that's it's so funny you mentioned that. Yeah, it's true. Like it's all about the community. It's the same way that whether you have ten thousand subscribers or a hundred thousand subscribers, the one thing which is keeping you afloat is always going to be those people returning. It's, you know, the people who watch YouTube videos, uh, when you look at analytics, it's usually the most people watching you are going to be the people who are returning, you know, people who are returning over and over and over again. And if you've got, um, you know, Instagram followers or YouTube followers, that's what it is. It's, um, it's just a community minded thing. And, uh, you know, me and you would never, have done this interview 20 years ago because I would have had to contact your manager and your manager would be yeah. like, why is this? No, he's not going to do anything for free. Like, no, he's not going to like just, you know, hop on a two hour call for free. No, no, fuck that. He's going to do this, this and this. And um, yeah, it, I've had great guests on, on, on this, sh- you know, show that I've got going on recently. Uh, just literally from messaging someone. Um, yeah. It's brilliant. I, speaking of which, um, let everyone know where to find you, where to find um, your band's Twitter, where to find them on YouTube. And um, the name Just a Ride, that's named after the, the, the song by, uh, is that, I'm forgetting who it was. How did you get the name Just a Ride? Oh, no, no. So it's not a song. It's, uh, I'm a massive Bill Hicks fan. And oh, Bill Hicks, Bill Hicks, that's it. Yeah, yeah. A legendary comedian whose probably most famous bit is It's Just a Ride. Like, he, he's just talking about, you know, there's all these things that you think in life are serious, but it's just a ride. Like, so, um, uh, you know, um, that was kind of, that was kind of the inspiration for, for the band name. Uh, yeah. Massive. And it's crazy. Like I was into Hicks like years and years and years ago. And I think if like his message is, is as, um, as important now as it, as it kind of ever was. <laughs> so he was a little bit ahead of the curve. But yeah, you can check us out if um, if you, probably Instagram is where we are the most um, active. Um, and our handle is at just a ride band. YouTube is youtube.com slash C slash just a ride. Um, and yeah, just go to our Instagram, click on the link thing and everything is there. You can find us on Spotify. If you search for just a ride, um yeah, yeah we're, we're on there um twitter we're on i think we're just i think we're just a ride band as well on twitter cool. and facebook so we're in all we're in all the normal places um and yeah we've got a new single new single out it's called uh, who you are working on a music video at the moment which is uh, which is good fun yeah. um yeah that music video will be out in a couple of weeks so uh so hopefully around the sort of time that, that this goes out i don't know what the turnaround is hopefully that will be closer if not out depending on, on how um, how quickly you pump it 
Amazing. Yeah. That's so exciting. Yeah, well, thank you for talking to me for the last uh, couple hours. That's really, really... <laughs> I, I can't believe, like, um, it's so funny how I spoke to Michael from Issues and the conversation only lasted 40 minutes and both the guys and the Atari's were about an hour each and we've gone for two hours because we've just covered so much <laughs> to do with the, the industry and touring and record labels and things like charting and record sales and yeah um it's amazing i love to talk as well <laughs> everyone, everyone says that's my that's my uh, biggest strength and biggest weakness but uh <laughs> and my, my big mouth probably uh, probably uh, also scuppered with parts of uh, vine delight too but that's another story for another day <laughs> very exciting it would be amazing um to yeah to maybe like hear a violent delight cover by just a ride one day at a, a <laughs> local gig or something like I'm sure, that i'm sure we know this well you know you, you're you're based out in prague so um uh, <laughs> I've, I've, my, one of my really good friends he um he runs a really big company out in 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 czech republic nice. um that uh that that kind of do tickets and all this kind of stuff so i'm um, definitely uh, once everything gets back to normal um and we want to start doing start doing gigs and whatever if we if we get down to prague i will let you know <laughs> please, please do yeah uh, prague or germany is very close by uh and or uh, austria vienna is a very good place yeah. to do gigs and I'm, I'm planning on moving back out to indonesia once covid is really truly dead and gone as well so any excuse to come do a a rock show in <laughs> indonesia as well oh, mate actually i'll tell you what i think i think drew our guitarist because he like i said he's he's a session session guy he um his favorite band is bon jovi and he's like the the backup for a bon jovi tribute band i think they went to indonesia to play like the, i mean the, the the cover the the you know the big cover bands like that's a huge huge industry like he i think he's been i think in indonesia i think he was i think he did like a, they did a tour in russia they've done india so like you know if the the regular guitarist can't make it they sometimes call in but i think he said like it was off the hook when when they went out there like it's like you know you play in like almost like little stadiums yeah yeah because i guess like that's the thing like the, you know it's the closest thing a lot of people might get to seeing bon jovi and they're really good as well like yeah. bon jovi oh that's really yeah. cool I, i've seen uh in, in orlando at the hard rock uh live which is connected to the hard rock cafe yeah, yeah. for led zeppelin uh tribute band a few years ago and the uk foo fighters they're a very very big band as well so so our drummer alex he was taylor hawkins for 10 years in the uk foo fighters i thought i thought so i remember hearing that on your instagram super interesting so you got some have you have you seen the documentary about them on bbc no i haven't watch it it's um if i don't know if you like the office but it's oh. kind of like watching the office because it is it's shot like a mockumentary and um um jay who's who's dave Grohl, everyone everyone um everyone who's watched it goes oh my god jay you're david brent <laughs> it's so funny oh man that sounds brilliant i'll watch that tomorrow actually because <laughs> i've been needing more music related stuff to watch well all right, I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll, uh, no I'll, worries, man. I'll get this all edited and knocked up. I hope you have a good rest of your evening. And uh, yeah, we're all excited for the next music video. Cool, cool. All right, man. Great to talk. You too. Take it easy. Yeah. All right. Bye.